Welcome to Season 3 of Voices of Value, where Rick Rushton and Peter Kakos continue their conversations with high-achieving guests who share their personal stories and, more importantly, the lessons they've learned from their journey. Whether it's Olympians sharing the roadmap that took them to a gold medal, professional sports people taking you inside their mindset, business leaders revealing their success strategies, or everyday people sharing life hacks, you can be sure you'll find value simply by joining the discussion with your hosts, Peter and Rick. Welcome to another episode of Voices of Value. It's Peter Kakos here with my co-host, Rick Rushton, and we are well into season three, speaking to some amazing people some incredible voices of incredible value. And I guess in times of somewhat turbulence, uncertainty, it is so nice to have our guest with us today who is going to give us that hope. It's a beautiful story. Rick, over to you. Thank you, mate. It's been an interesting season thus far. We've interviewed some you know, high-end media personalities. We've had some great stories across three seasons, haven't we? Uh, Olympic gold medalists and industry leading lights and things of that nature. But I honestly do believe that the power in real life stories is as good as it gets. And the story we've got to share today with our next guest is absolutely amazing. And as you started off in your introduction there, Pete, in a time of uncertainty, there's two things that most of us are certain of. Number one, the day we were born, our birth date. Number two, who our parents are. This is an individual that's lived nearly five decades on planet Earth, not knowing those two things. And so when you, you hear this story, I'm sure you're going to take a lot of absolute inspiration, but more importantly, the motivation to be grateful for what you've got, not necessarily the things that don't, you know, may, maybe show up the way that you want it at the moment. So Kim Perling, for those who are being introduced to him for the first time, is a world leading entertainer, has traveled to more than 140 countries across the globe, has worked with some of the most amazing, iconic industry acts in different particular countries, but most importantly, I guess, acts that would make my mum, who I know will be listening, shout out to mum, uh, my godmother who loves Engelbert Humperdinck. This is a man who was the musical director of one of the greatest voices of all time. Worked with Natalie Cole, has worked with David Cassidy. There's That, that one's for my sister, Pete. Um, <laughs> has worked with a list of names that you would know, but the one name you probably don't know is the man that we're out to introduce to the microphone and to our YouTube channel for a story that will absolutely, I believe, give you a new perspective, a greater level of gratitude for what you've got, and most importantly, some inspiration to say, if it's possible for this man here, it's possible for all of us to live a life of fulfillment, of gratitude, of letting your talent shine. It is with a great joy and a great thrill we introduce to our subscribers, Kim Perling. Kim, thank you so much for agreeing to be a part of our show. There's the studio applause. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have, I've had less than that, that applause, amount of applause before in my career. <laughs> <laughs> Kim, just for those who are you know, now just introducing themselves to you, your story is quite unique in the sense that you, know, you were a child during the Vietnam War in 1972. We know the year you were born. You know roughly the month you were born. That's about as much as you know about how you entered into planet Earth. Share your story with our listeners and viewers. Hey, that was a great preface, Rick. Um, yeah, the Vietnam War had been going on for almost two decades. And uh, I was found, I won't say abandoned, but I was found without known parents. When I was only two or three day, days old, they think that I was so small when they found me that I was only a few days old. And so for that reason, I celebrate my birthday on November 2nd. So I was probably found in the last couple of days of October, if this is all true. And it's all speculation. So this is a story that I've formulated and through paperwork and through contacts and stuff over the years. But um, I, was, I was taken by somebody, and this is, we don't even know who that was, uh, to I think a hospital first and then an orphanage in one of the outer suburbs of, of um, districts, I should say, of Ho Chi Minh City. And I was in that orphanage for probably about, well, about six and six or and a half months, probably it would have been. Um, and uh, there were so many babies in that orphanage. There were a lot of other small orphanages offshoot in offshoot in other streets nearby there, I think there were about 2,000 babies in the orphanage when I was there it's an incredible amount of misplaced and orphaned children and uh, and then around this time my parents in here in Adelaide South Australia had been trying to adopt a child from the Vietnam War in protest to the war and to help an orphan child um, I will also add that mum and dad have two great daughters of their own my elder sisters um, 
and at that time, time, I mean, even in the seven, early 70s, to, to consider adopting a child from Vietnam was unheard of, you know, and, my, and so, was, so was what I'm about to tell you, that they were actually going to adopt an Aboriginal child, you know, also unheard of, you know, but they thought there was more of a, a demand for babies and more of a need to be adopted from Vietnam. So they fought through a lot of the red tape with the Australian government and the Vietnamese government and uh, and uh, lawyers and all sorts of people. I'm not sure who they were in touch with. But um, eventually they received a photo from the second orphanage I was in, which was run by World Vision called the New Life Babies Home. And there I went for literally only about one or two weeks, we believe, um, that um, where I got better care. And they were in touch with a woman, Australian matron in, in, that, in that baby's home, who sent them a photo of me just weeks old and said, well, if you can get this you know, legislation passed or whatever through an adoption in Australia, um, you can have this baby, and of course, it was a handsome-looking baby, and so, <laughs> and it made them try even harder to to make this happen, and it did. And eventually, in August 1973, so I was about seven and a half months old at the time, I was flown on a big Qantas jumbo jet out to Melbourne, with no other passengers except for three other babies and a 14-year-old Vietnamese girl who was coming back to Australia to see a relative, and and one other passenger who was, I think, the accompanying nurse. Um, and a pilot, of course, and a co-pilot, I hope. Anyway, uh, I, I flew to Melbourne, and in my adult, and my mum my, my met me in Melbourne. They were living actually in Port Augusta at the time. My dad was a, a, a chaplain there, a minister there for the Uniting Church. Um, and uh, that, then my mum met me in Melbourne and then brought me back to South Australia. And then uh, and there were a lot of newspaper articles even at that time saying, you know, Vietnamese war waves coming to Australia and, you know, new adoption in Australia, unheard of, this sort of thing. And then it was really interesting. Um, and then I just grew up in Australia uh, like any other kid and in a very loving family environment. My parents never treated me any differently to their own children. And actually, I remember vividly when my mum came to Vietnam in 96 to watch some of my concerts. You know, she was, I was only 24 at the time playing performances. I know we're going to get to this eventually, but, um, play performances uh, with people that I could never even have a, a conversation with because of the language barrier. And she said to me, you know, I, I, we've always loved you just like I gave birth to you myself, you know, and it was, that's how every adopted parent should be with their, their children, you know. So I, I can say that I, I've probably had an amazing life and compared to any other regular person. Born and you made it. A loving family, yeah. And you made it so obvious there that the way that both David and Judith, you, your adopted parents, sort of, you know, had uh, virtually acted very quickly. They got the photo and they had to really make a snap decision. But mm-hmm. it was a decision that was backed up with a lot of thought and a lot of love. And not only did they bring you into their existing family where they had your older two sisters, which is obviously you know, Rebecca and Catherine, but um, and I'm sure that this would probably shock no one to say that they realised when you were about two and a half, maybe you, you wouldn't mind having a baby brother. So they adopted another Vietnamese baby. So you had a brother, Michael, to just complete the family. I mean, that is just absolutely amazing. That It speaks volumes to who they are as individuals absolutely. and what they're provided as, as a family. And so they must be immensely proud. Talk to us about observing your oldest sister, uh, Rebecca, having piano lessons and just watching her do that. And then for you to take on what you saw in that hour-long session and then just replay it, obviously through observation and imitation, and then with a bit of repetition, you were able to just blast out what she had learned in her lesson, you were able to mimic it straight away. Was that something that yeah, was the start of this ability to be creative with, with music, specifically the piano? Yeah, it wasn't, I won't say that it was one particular incident. You know, or and it was an hour long. I think I watched her many, many times as a, as, a, as a child and looked at the dots on the page and thought, oh, I don't know, what, what is she doing? But I remember um, that she used to play a, a, a song called Glowworm. I'm sure you know the song. And and an interesting later in my life, in my Vegas years, um, I actually performed with the Mills Brothers who made that song go very famous. <laughs> so went full circle with that. But I used to watch Rebecca play. And then um, just go over to the keyboard, reach up like this, reach up to the keyboard and, and just play the melodies she, she'd been playing. I wasn't playing full piano concertos, obviously, but I could, I could hear what was going on and whether I could understand exactly what was on the page and I, I could apply what I heard through my fingers to the piano and work, oh, that note does that, that does that, you know, and things started just to register a little bit. So at the age of six, that's when I started formal classical piano lessons. 
and uh, I, I had numerous teachers as, as, a, as a young boy, um, both of the late, the woman down the street, who was my first teacher and is still a good friend of mine, um, and um, and also a few teachers at the primary, during primary school and the high school, obviously. So I think that, that diversity of the teachers that I had was very worthwhile as well. Kim, coming from, um, coming from that adversity and that non-traditional sort of upbringing that the traditional Australian kid would go through, um, tell us a bit more. I'm, I'm just so intrigued about um, you've obviously got beautiful parents and what they did is, is just truly amazing. And to, and to look at that now, but tell us about these formative years. So from learning the piano at, say, at five or six and then on those teenage years, before we get into, you know, I can't wait to get to the Vegas story, by the way. But um, but before we get into everything else around that, what tell us about you know growing up and 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 those teen years as well, and um, I guess what it was like for a Vietnamese boy in Australia um, with adoptive parents. Um, any trials, tribulations? What 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 sort of things did you go through, and how did you yeah overcome somewhat adversity, if you like? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, well. I think I was, I've always been a very positive person. I've always been a very optimistic person. And, I, and, I'm, all, and I'm still the sort of person that everybody is innocent till proven guilty. So as a young boy, I don't think I ever was, you know, um, wary of other people or wary that I could be a victim of racism at any point, given point in time. I never even thought that way. I just was, I, I lived life to the fullest then and I still do now. But the interesting part is that when my brother came into the family and when we were young boys together, I, as young boys, I probably looked, well, I did, I looked more Eurasian. I looked more mixed blood. And I, we, used to, we used to comment that maybe you got French blood or something like that or, you know, you know anything it could be Australian Vietnamese blood because of all the soldiers that were in Vietnam at the war, in, uh, during the war. So we, we don't know, but we just knew that I didn't look fully Vietnamese. You know, and my brother Michael, he looked a lot more Vietnamese than I did, and or a lot more Asian even. You know, than I than I did as young boys, and I think he caught a bit more flack than I did from kids in the schoolyard and that sort of thing, and it affected him a lot more. You know, um, and I don't know why that is. I, you know, I guess children just you know see things that are different, so they have to comment. You know, and for me. Uh, I could probably count on one hand the number of times that happened to me, let alone affected me. Um, and with Michael, I think he copped a lot more. I remember him going home, you know, in tears one time, and I, and I felt so bad about it because I never experienced it on his level. Now I won't say that it happened every day or every week or every every, every year when we were boys, but I just remember a few occasions where that was that was the case. Um, now we'll fast forward quickly while we're talking about this is that about four or five years ago when I was in Adelaide, I was on a public bus and I was sitting towards the back of the bus. Two young 14-year-old boys got on the bus, sat behind me, and within the first two minutes of the trip, they were calling me every name under the sun with bad language. And then they started not spitting saliva. They were hocking mucus and spitting it on the back of my head and my shoulders. And and I just went to the bus. I, I actually turned around and said, I'm a bit surprised that you... um." don't know the difference between a Vietnamese and a Chinese and they were really surprised firstly probably of my accent being fully Australian and you know challenging with the comment about Chinese versus Vietnamese and then I went to the front of the bus and told the driver what had happened and he pulled the bus over and called transit police but the boys got off the bus before they came but that was an incident where I never expected it would happen you know uh, not in my adult years and not by two young boys a third my age <laughs> you yeah. know, so I'm only mentioning in that and fast forwarding to that incident because I've, it's it's interesting to note that I've I've been a victim of racism in my adult years and then more than I was in my childhood years. Isn't that amazing? And and just to again give some context, you have done the DNA test, haven't you, to just check what is your sort of lineage to a degree? Because there was the thought that you, are you possibly part Vietnamese, part something else? And yet the test came back pretty much that you are, as your brother Michael is, uh, you know, obviously of Vietnamese heritage right across the board, which is obviously that the two genes that don't make Vietnamese, but that is the that, that is the gene that allows you to, to sort of know that that is the case. And the other thing that I think is important for our listeners and viewers to know is that you have tried to find 
any trace of your biological parents, haven't you? But uh, at this stage, that, that that's just proven sort of a fruitless exercise because, as you said at the start, the record keeping around that time during a wartime, challenging time with, uh, and coming to the back end of the war as well, mm -hmm. and knowing that there were so many, um, I guess, orphanages that were just being overwhelmed with the amount of children that were being left on their doorstep, that it was pretty hard for them to come up with those sort of scenarios. And following off from Peter's question there, not so much about the race. Just before you do, sorry, just yep. just, just break in just quickly. Just before you do, it's, because I don't want to, to lose sight of this, and... It's, it's so intriguing to hear these stories because every single day we walk past someone and we make a, we make a judgment, you know, and, and, and typically people will judge tall, small, fat, thin, you know, quite attractive, non-attractive, whatever it may be. For, for some reason, we just like to label and so forth. But it's interesting if you take a different viewpoint on that and say every person you walk past has got a story. Now, we're talking to, to someone today with such an incredible story, you just wouldn't know. And I go back to, to my ancestors, my in-laws, my, my, my father-in-law who came out here as a three-year-old on a boat, stationed pier. Um, his whole family came over from Greece. Um, my grandparents who came over from Greece in late 20s, early 30s and so forth, came out here with absolutely nothing and built a life for themselves. And you get a kid who's grew up pretty much in an orphanage to start with, um, you know, had some beautifully kind people who gave him a chance at life. I just find it so fascinating. And, 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 I, and I just wanted to stop and pause that to just to, to let that resonate in with the viewers and listeners to say, hey, everyone's got a story. And before we judge, before we label, have a think about what someone may be going through. And, you know, and as I said before, in turbulent times and uncertain times like we're in, right now everyone's dealing with things a whole lot differently and that's what's so beautiful to hear to hear kim's story and, and and we've only just touched on the start of it but um but i just wanted to just make that point no you did yeah. and you know what 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 you said um pete is was so reinforced because i listened to the interview you guys did with susan berg last night and you, you you're talking about the story her story you don't know what someone's been through it's an incredible story incredible lady and and right, many of your interviews are like that so I think I think combating something like racism, or being closer to the other ethnicities in our in our communities, is, so, is it, that simple thing that you said is just key. Just understanding that we've all got a story. You don't know anything about someone you're looking at on the bus, other side of the bus, or in the park, or in the supermarket. You don't know anything about them, and they've probably got an incredible story, or even more incredible than your own. You know, and and when you have that attitude, then you just then you can cultivate love, really. You yeah, know. and you've, just got, you've got to be open to where the learning opportunities will come from, and it doesn't come from being closed-minded, to put everyone through a filter, to mm. have a label, mm. to have all those mm. predetermined things. It's, it comes from, you know, the possibility of finding out the story. I always love the quote from... Um, you know, Abraham Lincoln, who was told that someone didn't like him at all, thought he was a pretty ordinary person, and, and Lincoln's response was, then I must get to know him better to yeah. say I must get to know who that person is and how he thinks yeah. and my view is and again on the, our podcast going back uh, to season two when we interviewed Nathan Buckley who grew up in Darwin in the Northern Territory and some of his best friends were Aboriginal Indigenous kids and he didn't know any different until he got to the city about what racism looked like he said you've got to be open to the possibilities of where the learning can come from because you just don't know and so yeah. one of the things that I guess as we finish with this part of this this chapter of your life, which is an amazing chapter, I guess my question uh, was realistically as someone who's, I know my parents, I know my birth date, I know my lineage, I know everything, and I've heard stories from those that are always on the search for what, the, you know, to, to find out who they are today. And they need to get an understanding about where they've come from and their heritage and their lineage and know that you did have a go at that and tried to find that out, Kim. How have you, I guess, not, not uh, re reasoned with it in your mind, but how have you satisfied yourself uh, about that chapter of not probably ever going to know and, and understanding what you do know about, you know, your beautiful parents that, you, that, that raised you? How do you, you rationalise that in your brain, not knowing your actual birth date and not knowing your actual biological parents? How do you rationalise that? Well, I'm going to, I'm, great question, Rick. I'm going to go right back to the beginning because as, as long as I can remember, one of the first things I can remember my parents doing was sitting me down when I was young enough to understand I was adopted. 
and they sat me down with a book. I can't remember the author, but it was a, a children's book designed for adults. It was called Why Was I Adopted? And it was big, bold letters and big pictures for kids and stuff like that. And um, and they sat me down and said, you know, we, we aren't the ones that gave birth to you, but we, you are our parents now. We don't know who your parents are. And, you know, I don't have to tell you the rest. You can imagine how that goes. But I just thought I got up from the sofa and went, okay, cool. <laughs> you know, and, and, I'm, and I'm telling you that because I think from that moment, as simple and as powerful as it was, it carried me through the rest of my life because I think I got up from the sofa and thought, well, I'm going to do as much as I can in my life. There's no reason why I shouldn't, you know, and I never turned back. I never, ever turned back, I don't think. I think I just thought, you know, and also I, I will couple this by saying I think a lot of ministers, my dad's a minister of religion at United Church of Australia, I think I think a lot of ministers, kids and adopt kids and that combination for me just made me go, well, I better do something good in my life. You're seeing, um, you know, you know and I've always sort of quietly had that attitude. I've never really shared that with people, but I, I do do feel that way. It's like, well, I better do something with my life and make the most of it because I'm so so privileged to have been brought into this family. And and it, it has been an incredible journey. It's been an incredible journey. I want to go back, Rick, and answer one question about the DNA thing you were talking about. Was, yes, I did, I've actually done four DNA tests. Oh, okay. there, are, there are three main companies in the world, mostly in two in Canada, oh, in the US and one in Canada, Ancestry DNA, Family Tree DNA, and 23andMe. Um, I did I did tests with all of them so that I could upload. I've got the help of a, a good friend, Craig, in, in the US who knows a lot about DNA. He does a lot of the DNA tests for television shows with people looking for their for their parents and stuff like that. So I'm in good hands with him directing me as often as I need to. Um, and as often as I want to continue this search. But um, uh, I did those tests because it get, I can upload those results to a database and therefore it's like throwing three nets into the ocean instead of one and seeing what you can catch, you know. And and I did one uh, DNA test in, in Ho Chi Minh City when I was there a couple of years ago just to see what would, would, I, what would come of that. So I, w- I have found lots of third and fourth cousins on all three tests of uh, those main companies, but in the DNA world, that really doesn't mean much. You know, you and I are probably fifth or sixth cousins. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I get it, and yeah. and I get that understanding around that. And I, I think the other thing that I love, Pete, when I heard you know Kim just saying, I felt that it was the opportunities I've been given. I have to make the most of uh, of that opportunity and be the best version of myself. I, I'm paraphrasing mm-hmm. kind of how how he said it, but knowing that your dad was obviously chaplain of the Westminster School that you w- went went to, and mm-hmm. obviously that's a that's a really good opportunity to get a well rounded education. Clearly, music was your gift, and music is the talent that you. Pursued, but it was a, a whole rounded situation. When did you know that that was going to be your your sort of passion in life to pursue professionally? Because obviously you went to uni, you, you did well. I know you, you did your masters at the University of Las Vegas, Nevada. What an interesting place to go do your your masters in music. I would have thought. And and Pete and I have been to Vegas. Uh, we've went we've, we went every night. We went to a show, didn't we, mate? We were we were just so enamoured with the amount of talent that was just on mm. display. Yeah, you know, going any sort of go in any sort of casino and you're seeing a world-class act but you were obviously on your way to becoming a world-class performer was it high school was it university when did you get the sense that this was really your your vocation is probably the wrong word but where, where the arena that you could let your yeah. talent shine yeah shooting back to year 11 and 12 when you do careers at, at school you know um careers guidance counseling i should say or whatever um i was th- I never thought I would have a music career. Piano- playing the piano was just something I enjoyed doing. Never thought of it as a career. And I was looking at being a teacher because I was, I was interested to work with kids. I was interested in architecture because I was very good at design and drawing. You know, and I'm, in year 12, I was in 12 music groups in year 12. And, um, and I got, and I was very good at anything creative. So I got full marks in English in year 12. A lot more marks than I did get in music because I broke a lot of rules in the music class. Um, <laughs> putting the wrong notes and chords to, to traditional piano forte and vocal harmony. And and I was also very good at art in year 12. So my mum thought that, you know, it was a toss-up between doing art or music at the end of high school. But then something very interesting happened. A, a local pianist here in Adelaide and a friend of mine, Karen Bailey, a marvellous jazz pianist and a fantastic teacher, I went to him in my final year of high school because I knew that I was searching for other things musically and I wasn't sure what it was. 
So someone said, go and sit, have a lesson with Karen Bailey. And he gave me a cassette tape. And for the millennials, that's a little thing with spills and stuff. <laughs> they, can, they, can, they can Google that. They can Google yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I put this cassette tape on and it had a variety of pianists, Oscar Peterson, uh, uh, Andre Previn, Keith Jarrett, Chick Corea. And I listened to them all and I loved them all, but the music of um, the, the tracks of um, Oscar Peterson on there really hit home to me, just hit a chord with me, pardon the pun. And um, <laughs> and, and, I decided, and I thought, oh, I love that sound. I love the swinging sensation of the music. I love the bluesy influ- influence it is playing. And I thought, that's what I want to do next. You know, so, and at the time, Adelaide, uh, and Stuart does have a very good course, had a, a brilliant um, jazz course at Adelaide University. So straight out of high school, I went to do that and art and sport and everything else I was interested in just disappeared. And, and and I felt like I had this huge set of wings on my back. I could fly with the music, with all this freedom that you can find in jazz and the ability to express in real time and improvise. So I found what I feel was my calling and certainly a huge, huge chapter for the following musical years of my life. Which is, I know, the part that Pete wants to get into and that's uh, sort of oh, your... Before, before <laughs> that, though, I mean, you're right. Back to Vegas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was. No, but, yeah, I do. I secretly, yeah. I, anywhere, anywhere out of Melbourne at the moment would be good, but Vegas, yeah, great. But um, but even going back to you're only 14 and you toured Malaysia playing the trumpet, you know, as a 14 year old, yeah, yeah. and then um, and then going into um, the jazz studies and so forth at university to doing 200, 250. But you know, going back as a 14 year old, going to Malaysia playing the trumpet and doing performances there, what was that like? Yeah, that was enjoyable. I won't say that I wasn't doing a solo career there. That was with a school band, but mm. I was, but I was, um, that was my first taste of international travel, and and I, I think even back then, Pete, I connected the fact that oh, you can play music and it can actually take you places, you know, yeah. and and the travel's been a huge uh, component of my life ever since I can remember. So. Um, I love the fact that I could play music and be in a completely different environment and interact with people outside of Australia. And, and, um, and that was, you know, and I, I remember being out of all the school kids that were on the plane, I was the only one that didn't stay in my seat. And I was talk, talking to all the, all the uh, flight stewards and stewardesses in the galley, most of the <laughs> flight to Singapore, you know, and, you know, and, and that's always the way I have been. I've always been like that, just taking it all in and, you know, stepping out of my seat and, metaphorically speaking and you know absorbing what's around me whether it's talking to flight flight crew or kidding in some little village with 12 people or you know whatever i think so what, it, what this yeah. talk, this this has been hopefully you know oh i'm sure our listeners and viewers will will already notice this at the moment you've got every reason at the start of your life not to have a great attitude about life um but one thing i'm already picking up kim is just you have just been so open to things, but most importantly, you've been so incredibly grateful of the opportunities that, that were presented to you. And I think, you know, that attitude has opened up so many doors. Would that be would that be fair to say? And Absolutely. eventually, and I love to hear you say, you know, it felt like I had these wings. It's because yeah. you followed a dream. You've got you've got so much love. You've clearly grown up now with so much love, and you've got so much love and and appreciation of of, of people and environments. And that's just this has just shone through. We haven't even got through to, to the latter part of life yet, yeah. but but this was just a wonderful what it seems like to me was a wonderful foundational experiences. Um, but in, an incredible openness, open mindedness in terms of mm. opportunities that existed and mm. and that mm. um, putting out that energy and I guess they presented themselves in in great ways. And yeah. not only that, Pete, you know, I think what I also heard there, not wanting to correct you, Kim, but it was your second trip internationally because your first trip was from Vietnam to Melbourne. So it was your second time on a plane <laughs> coming somewhere uh, really, really well. My question now, as I think is the segue to what I know is intriguing my co-host and one of my best friends, is that leap from Adelaide to Vegas to therefore then that whole opening for not just, you know, performing in one of the, the entertainment capital of the world, kind of, but to also then be doing effectively, you know, stuff like, um, you know, uh, Broadway and travelling, touring with some great shows and, you know, like just we can, we can go into that uh, for mm-hmm. a whole show on its own. But what did you pick 
the University of Las Vegas to do your masters, or did that pick you? How did, how did it kind of go? What was the what was the, the the I guess the key decisive factor to 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 get your masters in the US? Yeah, Vegas picked me actually, and at the time, I uh, you know I, I should fill in one little gap here, Rick, that I did it I, when I got out of university in Adelaide. I worked very steadily in Adelaide for six years, so. I didn't just get out of uni and head to Vegas. You know, I, I had a lot of, like Pete just mentioned, I did over 250 gigs a year for about a six or eight year period in Adelaide. And and I was still, it was my formative views. I just got out of uni and still sort of consolidating everything that I'd learned at, at uni, you know, and putting it into my playing, starting bands, doing gigs all over town. But what, what happened, I, was, I knew that in the mid-90s, probably about 96 or 7, I knew that I wanted to spread my wings even further and, and leave Adelaide. And I was considering moving to Melbourne or Sydney, but decided, and I nearly signed a lease in Melbourne. But just as I put pen to paper, I thought I was feeling something. It, did, it didn't feel right. So I turned this, the landlord down and said, no, nah, sorry, this is not right. And I knew that I wanted to go to the States. Now, most of my friends had gone to America to have lessons with their favourite players in New York or wherever, and then come back after the three-month tourist visa ended. But I knew that I didn't want to do that. I knew that I needed to go and I needed to go and I needed to stay <laughs> and absorb what the US had to offer. And at that time, I had a friend from Adelaide um, doing a graduate assistantship, a GA they call it, at the University of Las Vegas. And what that is is when you do a master's degree, because I was trying to up the ante, the quality of the international students there. So I did a graduate assistantship too completed my master's degree and also taught on the faculty of the university. And I thought, you know what, never expected to go to Las Vegas, but um, it'll give me a couple of years to just work out how I can stay beyond, you know, the degree. And that's exactly what I did. And and like you mentioned before, the degree, the, the master's degree was relatively simple, you know, I did. And uh, and I and I should also mention I had uh, they had an amazing big band that I brought back to Australia in 1999, all with young guys, student musicians, who were all playing professional on a professional level from the sh- playing in showrooms and bands on the Las Vegas Strip. So that was that was a good feather in my cap to return back to Australia. And I think I did a 7:30 report special with all these 18 American musicians in tow. So that was you know really really rewarding. So that's how I ended up in Vegas. But the real education, of course, as you've mentioned a few times already, was performing in all the showrooms with these great entertainers. And, and I'm, so I'd really become this sort of, um, I won't say sheltered, but compared to what I've done now, I could say sheltered. Um, jazz musician growing up and, and developing in, in Adelaide, little old Adelaide, and then suddenly in the entertainment capital of the world. And, um, and there I was learning what I was learning so many things I would not have learned having stayed anywhere in Australia. Um, what, how these great legendary acts put their shows together. What sort of song do they open the show with? What sort of lighting do they open the show with? What sort of, what's the, what, how does the curve of the show go in regards to the repertoire they choose for the show? What do they say between the songs that make people laugh? You know, how do you, how do you make a show? And I, and I learned so much from those people. And I was so grateful not just to play behind them, but also rub shoulders and have conversations with them. And I'm talking about people like Paul Anker, who came up and sat next to me at the piano once and, and uh, blew me away. And Chick Corea came into one of my concerts once, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and working with Cassidy, like you said, and Marlena Shaw and, and uh, um, Joe Williams and all these amazing acts, you know, in showrooms and lounges in, in Las Vegas. I was just boom, like that. And I realised that um, I wasn't just a little jazz musician. Then. I realised that I'm learning a lot more for a reason. You know, and it's about, as a musician, it's a hard enough business already. But And as a pianist, we're fortunate enough to probably have a few more opportunities available to a pianist and a musical director. But I realised that, you know, you have to put, keep putting feathers in your cap to become bigger and versatile and more capable. And that's the reason I've been able to sustain a career for so long, you know, and that's and what is it, Kim, about pianists specifically that makes them great musical directors? Because you think of you know some of the biggest acts in the world today, like Michael Bublé's mm. whole concert is driven by a musical director who is his pianist who he absolutely trusts. There's you know you were the musical director for Engelbert Humperdinck, one of the greatest voices of mm. all time. You've you've what is it about the piano player, if that's the right way of saying it, that makes them mm. so good 
at being the organizer, if you will, the, the director of, you know, the pilot of the show. Because you're talking to two guys here who love shows. We, we were into sound and lighting, weren't we? We were ahead of our time, let's be honest. We used to run, we used to run programs, mate, where we would go and hire lighting and, you know, ice machines and fans and we, we would be getting the whole flow and event to, to really take off. What is it about the, someone like yes. you that has that sort of ability to do? Yeah, I think naturally the nature of the piano being an orchestral instrument in itself, having 88 keys from the bottom to the top and being able to, you know, play chords and harmony and, and, and even a score in some form, um, that I think alone enables piano players to become musical directors more because they can, they're used to, the instrument itself allows you them more freedom and they understand what the other instruments are doing. Um, and I think, um, I think when you grow up in your career, you, you conduct a little cabaret show with just a three-piece band. They're always following a piano player, you know, and he's the one that counts things off. And I think that's just been like that for years and generations. Um, and then, of course, some people go on and just become band leaders and, and, and spend less time at the piano. And also through my career, I've had some amazing musical directors that were, were drummers, you know, or guitarists. And, and, those, that, and that has been rewarding as well. I don't think that's always as effective because it's hard to watch a musical director when the drummer's at the back of the stage, you know, but not to say that their ability wasn't, wasn't good or, you know. So, so for me, um, I've been fortunate enough to be able to open up more doors where it's enabled me to conduct things. And, and, I've, and I never actually had any conducting lessons when I was younger, and, uh, <laughs> which will lead into the other Broadway show chapter when you're ready to hear that one. <laughs> yeah, well, I oh, think, so I mean... That, great, great segue. I was just yeah. to bring up this Broadway because, yeah, yeah. Rick. Yeah. And I think, well, I just think that, you know, that's the other thing. The Broadway, yeah, 42nd Street, such, a, such an iconic musical and, you know, Footloose. you're obviously... Footloose. Footloose, yeah. Well, Footloose was more the tour wasn't but I guess the one I'm and I've got to be careful how I say this but I'm just very intrigued about what it must have been like to be a part of Miss Saigon for those who don't understand Mm. musical theatre Miss Saigon is clearly almost like that's almost the soundtrack to your life to a degree Mm. or at least the beginning of your life if we suspect as we thought but Mm. we now since genetically found out not the case but Miss Saigon for those who don't follow it is the story at the end of the Vietnam War about an American GI who falls in love with an Indigenous Vietnamese lady and they, they have a child not that he knew that because he goes back to the state what was that like for you each night to sort of you know perform that particular in that particular musical knowing that that's you know so close to your real life example it was an, it was an amazing experience you reckon and i did that show particularly for that reason you know um i wanted to have an emotional attack i'd try to always have an emotional connection or some meaningful connection to anything i do musically and I didn't have that with Footloose. <laughs> but, uh, but, but when the opportunity... Yeah, yeah. When the, when the opportunity you, you can see we're very highly cultured. Footloose is our musical. That's... Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, it's right up that. there with Dirty Dancing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's right there. It's right there. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, but um, to answer your question, when I, when I had the opportunity to work with Miss Saigon, um, I jumped at the opportunity because I wanted because I wanted to do it not only because of my own personal background but also because and the story of the show but also because it's such an amazing story and a musical score which is a, it's called what they call a sung through musical where there's no actual dialogue without music so every spoken sentence and conversation is all sung to music which I think is, is that like like lay is that yeah yeah yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Both composed by Claude Michel Schoenberg and Alan Bublil. And I was able to work with them when I worked on, when we mounted the show of Miss Saigon. Um, and that wow. was an incredible experience. Um, you know, so um, I did that show uh, for, the, for those reasons and to actually be able to understand the show more because by playing it every night and, and after a couple of months, you really understand the show. And I was with that show for two years. And I also wanted to see how the media would react to, to working with that show. Mm-hmm. And I performed that show all around North America and Canada. And, and fortunately, I did have a lot of media interest. I did a lot of TV interviews and radio interviews and newspaper interviews all the way across America um, because they could all recognise the, the connection between the, my story and the story of the show. But um, 
I, I want, if you allow me, guys, I want to tell you how I got into the Broadway shows because this is quite an interesting story. Please do. Please, yeah. please. This is where, where the Vegas chapter ended and the, and the Broadway one started. I was musical directing for Jack and Holland, a good friend of mine in Vegas, and, and she was singing with Wayne Newton at the time. So um, she got a phone call from a theatrical company in New York City saying, we've just we've just uh, sent out the national tour of Footloose, the musical. It's only been out a week and a half and we're letting the conductor go already. And do you know anyone that would want to conduct the show and travel and see more of the country? And of course, all I'd seen is the Las Vegas strip and a couple of trips to LA, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and I was dying to see New York and more, which is where I really wanted to be um, and more of America. And she put, she volunteered me for the, for the job. And literally, I still had clothes on the floor in my apartment in Vegas and three days later I flew out to Wilmington, Delaware and I met the company manager in the theatre, in the in the hotel lobby and the cast and crew and orchestra were all in bed, at, it was one in the morning or something, all in bed getting sleep before we get on the bus and go to the next show, you know. And I met PD, Seltzer, great company manager, great guy. I met him in the lobby at 1am, he gave me Act 1 and Act 2 two huge binder folders of Act 1 and Act 2 of Footloose the Musical looked at me and said, what's the conductor for the next two nights? Just start on Saturday night. Oh, wow. Right? Wow, and wow. I, and I, I'm not lying. I've never conducted a thing in my life. Not a thing. That's incredible. And except for a few little trio things in, in behind cabaret shows and small theatres. So, so they, they trusted you enough and they took... The well, what you don't know doesn't kill you, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> and then that, and that's that's that, that's so true. You, if people don't know a lot about you, but if you're recommended and the recommendations, you know, go far in this mm. business. Um, you, if if uh, if you're recommended by somebody that you trust, then you, you go for it, right? So they they trusted Jacqueline because they they valued her opinion, but they knew nothing about me. And what happened is I flew out there, got this music, and I sat in the orchestra pit for the next two nights and I watched Andrew. Andrew's a good friend of mine and an amazing conductor. I watched everything he did with his hands on every bar of music in the, on the score, scribbled on every measure of the, of the page what he did with his hands, watched the set pieces go across the thing, watched when he was taking cues from the red light on the, at the podium, watched when, um, you know, light, he took cues from lighting changes, cues and stuff like that. And I, and I, my score looked like scribble, you know, at the end of two nights. And then during the day, before showtime in the evenings, I remember getting up at some ridiculous hour in the morning and spending all morning and all day up to when I had to be at the theatre and watch him do those two shows with the headphones on, the CD of Footloose, not including all the other songs I'd written into the show and all the underscoring and everything that's not, in, you know, not on the CD. With the CD and the headphones on, those two huge folders of music on the music stand, standing in front of the mirror and watching myself going like that. Now, does that look good? Are they going to understand what I'm doing there? How do I bring that up? How do I play that? You know, and, and that's exactly what I did. And I did something right because I took that show to 247 American cities in the following 11 months. Wow. That is just wow. So you got, you got your wish and that was to see a bit more of uh, America yeah. than just Vegas and LA. <laughs> I travelled 50 states with Footloose and Miss Saigon and with 42nd Street. So that is just uh, amazing. Just, uh, which leads me to the next question. So you've you've done the small, intimate cabaret type style things, the the big platform stages, the showrooms. Um, you, you you played in front of eighty five thousand, I think, at a jazz festival. So you've had yeah. the and big arenas. Also with ben Hank, yeah, and yeah, yeah. So you, can you see the depth of research we've been able to do here, mate? <laughs> These are, this is this is quality well the way. But is there any particular? And it'd be probably unfair. It's a bit like asking a parent which is which is your favourite child. Is there any is there any show or any run or any event that just stands out as if you were to put a, a moniker on that was a real highlight of? Because uh, I guess two hundred and forty odd shows could blend into each other. But is there a, a performance or an event or or show that you just sort of really hold close to is that was a really great you know night or a great run or a great uh, mm. uh, program mm. well well to round off the broadway part of the conversation i would say that that opening night when you open a broadway show is pretty thrilling because when when the process generally what happens is when we're in new york we audition dancers we audition musicians for the orchestra we start working with the principal actors on their songs, and we and, and and a show like Forty Second Street, we 
started rehearsing the dances a month before we even brought the principals in because they have so many dance routines to learn, you know, and we, we, we're doing that in studios in Chelsea in Manhattan and we haven't even put it on a stage yet. And then at the, the, the relationship we had with the theatre in, um, in um, Dayton, Ohio, the Victoria Theatre, we would they would let us have the theatre for two weeks before opening the show. So that would gave us an opportunity to then put the show on a stage, mount lights, fit scenery, measure scenery, you know, and um, and all this stuff put together. We're talking months, a few months of solid hard work, and then to do that opening night show is an amazing experience. You know, you we all feel like family. We've slogged it out for months and months, and then to, to do that show, that curtain goes up, and then when it goes down, it's just a, a, a real thrill. And I felt the same way with all three of those Broadway shows. Um, but another experience would be with Engelbert, of course, conducting for him at Royal Albert Hall, you know, one of the most prestigious uh-huh. concert halls in the world. And, uh-huh. and, and and with Engelbert, we played in all the prestigious concert halls around the world and around England. And, and that, it's when you walk out and some of the big outdoor arenas and when you walk out on that stage and see so many people, it's, it's a real adrenaline rush. It's really great. The really adrenaline? Great. Or is, it, is, it, is it pressure? Is it stress? Or is, it, is it adrenaline? I mean... Do, do, you, do you suffer from that or do you just embrace no. it? And I'll tell you what, you? I'll tell you what, um, I thrive off it, but I won't say I'm not, I'm never nervous, but I will, but I will also say I don't get nervous very often because I think when you really know what you're doing, there's no reason to be nervous. You just go out and do it because you've worked hard on it, you know? Um, mm. And um, that would be very true of, you know, when I work with Natalie Cole, and I'll tell you about that in a moment. But um, I did a TV show when I was 16. The first television performance I did was on New Faces. Remember New Faces with Daryl <laughs> Summers? Yeah. Yeah, just, yeah. I had a, uh, there was a gentleman, an English gentleman who lived in Australia for many years and called Wally Card. Do you know Wally? Have you heard of no. Wally? No. Amazing, amazing man. We lost him a few years ago, but um, he amazing entertainer, sweetheart of a of a guy, and very encouraging to me. And he said, "Kim, you know, you, in this business, you got to get as much experience." This is when I was at Westminster, guys. And he said, "You got." He was teaching vocal students there, and he said, "You got to get as much experience as you can in this business. I'm going to put your name forward to Channel Nine in Melbourne to go on New Faces." And I went, "No, I wait, 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 no, no, no." <laughs> and he just went ahead and did it. And later that year, I flew out. This is the first time I'd ever been on an airplane, but other than coming to Australia, Rick, of course. Um, I flew to Melbourne <laughs> and um, got off the plane and there's a taxi waiting there and a voucher for the taxi. I thought that was really cool, a cab charge voucher. I thought that was cool. <laughs> and it took me straight to the hotel and I got to the hotel and there's an envelope with instructions of how the rest of the day is going to go and what I need to do and beware. And I thought that was really cool. You know, so that was this little first unfolding, which was really fun. And then I went to the studios and I played on New Faces and I played this Billy Joel instrumental piece, which is called Prelude. It's an instrumental thing before Angry Young Man, one of his vocal pieces. So it's a very spectacular piece. But if you watch the video, you see me, I mean, I'm 16 years old and there's cameras flying around everywhere, lights flashing and a live studio audience, right? And I'm like, <laughs> looking like this panic, this panic dog, right? <laughs> and then it was a two and a, I remember it was, I, we had two and a half minutes on it to, to perform. And by the time that two and a half minutes was over, I was smiling at the camera and I was loving every minute of it. You know? <laughs> give me more, give me more, give me another two and a half minutes. <laughs> yeah. Give me well, another well, two and a half minutes. You, but, you got, but, so do you understand what I'm saying? It's like you do, do you, the more things you do that scare you, the stronger you become. And, and, right. those, mm. and those fears, even from that one incident, that carried me through lots of things. And then, um, you know, and and I don't think I've had such a such a terrifying moment. Even walking out on stage with Engelbert or Natalie Cole was as frightening as doing that when I was sixteen. So I I always tell people that kids that story when I do workshops at schools. I tell them that story because you you got to do things that make you stronger. 
Pressure is a privilege, isn't it? So, you know, if you've got that opportunity to entertain and, you know, have that opportunity, then it's not like you're sort of winging it. Although I've never seen any clip of you playing any sort of piece of music with any accompanying notes. You seem to understand where you're going with it before you even start putting your fingers to the keyboard. So that tells me that preparation precedes results and you've, you've done the hard work and you know you can sort of perform at all sorts of levels. And when you are segueing back to Natalie, because I'm conscious of time and we know that we're, we're coming to the end and I don't want to miss the story about Natalie Cole, but to give you a bit of pretext, Kim, when Pete and I were in Vegas in 2007, we, we saw Danny Gans who was running yeah. at the Mirage at that time before he moved across to the encore and uh, the thing that I think really stood out in my mind was he could do Nat King Cole singing Unforgettable with the microphone in his right hand, then switch the microphone to his left hand and do oh. Natalie Cole's part. So he could sing like Nat King Cole, one of the best baritone voices of all time, yeah, yeah. and then, then imitate his daughter who yeah. was just, and uh, I remember Pete and I just looking at each other, we, jaw on the ground stuff, I, I, hairs on the back of my neck are going up, even remembering that story now as I share it with you. What was, what was it like sort of being with one of the best voices, greatest voices of absolute all time in terms of Natalie Cole? Mm. That was an amazing experience. And another, I've got another great story about that one. And, and another, and it just demonstrates how cutthroat and how difficult and competitive this business can be and how you have to be on top of your game. Because I was, I was doing it, I lived in Florida for a while and I was, I was doing a lot of TV work for Home Shopping Network, um, you know, major shopping um, TV channel televised 24 7 around all 50 states of America. It's probably gets more, it's probably got the most viewing. Um, numbers but um i was doing a lot of stuff for, for them and for adrian arpel a cosmetics person from new york very successful woman and i was playing some shows for them playing for our adrian's anniversary shows once a year she'd bring me in to play in and out of tv commercials to celebrate another year with hsn but um after a while they said Kim, Natalie Cole's coming and we're going to do a one-hour TV show with her to promote her holiday Christmas CD. Um, could you play for her for, for the one-hour show? And I went, let me check my diary, yes. <laughs> um, <okay. laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then this is what happened. They, they, we negotiated the fee and all this stuff and then the management, um, her, Natalie's management emailed me the music for the show. There were some MP3s that they sent digitally and some charts that they sent digitally. and. I realised if this is TV, I don't want to have music up on the stand. They didn't say I had to do it, learn it off by heart. I just knew that it's not going to look good if you're working with Natalie Cole to have all these music sheets up on the piano. So I devoted a good solid two or three weeks learning that whole one-hour show off by heart, right? And so I could just focus on Natalie and smile at the cameras and make it all look good like you need to do for TV. And I got to the studio three hours before the show and they were happy to see me there and they put me at the piano, set lights again and, and it took me back to the, the new faces thing when they first did that when I was 16. But they were setting lights and camera angles and everything like that with me at the piano, testing the piano sound. And then the studio wanted to arrive two hours before the show. They were briefing them about how, what's going to happen here, when the cameras are coming here, when you need to clap, all that stuff. And then an hour before the show, we were all sort of just relaxing until showtime. And it was an afternoon and the show was supposed to start at 2 p.m. And at 1.30, I'd still not even met Natalie, right? At 1.45, still had not met Natalie, let, not even seen Natalie. And I'm telling you, five minutes before the show, the studio manager calls out in front of everybody, okay, we're ready for it. says to the, um, says to the um, production manager, okay, we're ready for Natalie. And then Natalie's manager yells out to Natalie's personal assistant, okay, we're ready for Natalie. Right, one minute before the show, she comes out looking absolutely gorgeous with this sparkly microphone and um, stunning silver dress. And she comes up to the stage and she's looking out to the audience. And then, just for about 30 seconds before air, she turns around and says, Oh, you must be Kim. Nice to meet you. And then, <laughs> I'm not, that's, I'm not kidding. I'm not, I'm not making any of this up. And then she says, Nice to meet you. Turns back around three into the show. 
Wow. wow. <laughs> so if, if you look on YouTube and put Kim Perling That's and Natalie Cole, you can see a few videos from that show. And it looks like we've been working together for 10 years. I did, well, I did watch that. And that's exactly what it looked like. Yeah. yeah, yeah and, and that's yeah. how Pete and I do these interviews. As you know, Kim, we just sort of do no planning, no preparation. <laughs> we just look at each other and go, three, two, one. Are you hitting record? Am I hitting record? Away <laughs> we go. It just seems to be the way that it rock and rolls. As we wrap up now, because we are, you yeah, know, this is a story that you could listen to for hours upon hours. But I think the, the general instances that we want to cover was your incredible story where you're one of the, if not the first uh, person adopted into the Australian sort of society from not just Vietnam, but from any country realistically back in 1972 and the opportunities that you've been given and how your talent has found a way for your wings to expand and to, to shine and to get you know overseas and to things of that nature. In wrapping up, what what's the next? Because we found you through our good friends Darren Mullen and obviously Constantine oh, yeah. Dello from the Highland Street Country Club, and Pete. I remember just watching because you know I'm a vigorous HSCC fan, you and uh, yeah. um, and I just remember just watching the bad girls doing a a pointer sister version. I'm thinking, who's this dude on the bloody keyboard? It's just absolutely. He looks like he knows shit. what he's doing. Yeah, I'm thinking. <laughs> But he's actually, he's watching everyone else and he's taking the chemistry off everybody else. And it was very clear to me that the performance wasn't about what he was doing. He was making sure he was in tune and ready to go with everybody else. And I remember thinking, you know, and I just, all that happened, Pete, just so you know, and so our listeners and viewers know, I just made a comment about what a great job, the great piano playing. And, and Kim then just responded back saying, hey, thanks for the feedback. And then I just, I watched your interview with the HSCC boys. It was amazing. And, you know, you know, uh, and it was a bit of backwards and forwards before it was like, well, you know, I don't know if you're ever looking for someone to have a chat to. I've got a, a story. As if he's just describing, if you've got a half hour to kill, you know, I could probably tell you two or three things. This is a story that I reckon Hollywood could make a movie out of, if the truth be known. Mm. But in summary, Kim, you know, obviously you're back in Adelaide at the moment. You've, you've travelled to, well, north of 140 countries. You've laid roots long term in the US for a while. You've done a, a whole heap of place. Obviously, there's no place like home and we get all of that. What's the next sort of, you know, uh, coming out of this COVID challenge and getting when entertainment, there's going to be such a thirst for, you know, entertainment and gatherings. What's, what's, your, what's your next sort of five years looking like? Well, I can't say, and I'm happy not to be able to say, because I love the not. I love the unknown. You know, I'm not scared. I'm not scared of being unemployed, or and I haven't been unemployed for years. But I'm not scared of to seeing where the next chapter lies. Definitely, for many of us, the COVID period has been a transition, and it's brought me back to Australia. Um, and I don't, because of my two bases of New York and Paris, I don't want to be in either of those places at the moment. And since I've been back, I've been welcomed with open arms. Um, I've, I've always done concerts in Australia when I, every couple of years when I've come home to visit the family. And I've always had, always sold every single concert out. And so it's a testimony to the audience that I have here because for 22, 22 years later, you think you're going to be forgotten, but people just, sell out my concerts and it's it, and I'm so flattered that they do that as the, many things have happened in my life I, if you just be open to it and put the energy out into the universe and do you know just be a good person and do what you do well things just sort of come to you and and, and all that always happens when I'm back in Adelaide definitely happening during this period so I'm happy to just see what happens while I'm here um with with the idea that um you know America's still my base and Paris is still my base, and I've now now I've got a network all over the world. So I'm I feel very universal, <laughs> and and, yeah. and I'm and I'm happy to know that I have a career in various parts of the world now. Well, I well, think Kim, it's a, you um yeah. you you are a great person, and um and and some of the stuff we didn't get to talk about today was a time there in your twenties when you're in Ho Chi Minh City, and your oh, yeah. uh, your hotel room basically became a teaching studio for those who was a bit of a revolving door of people that just wanted to learn from you and you were so um, so um, open to to sharing and helping others learn and helping yeah. others on their journeys. And that speaks volumes of the type of um, type of person you are. And not to forget, and the last point I want to make, Rick, and just finish on, um, Kim, is is the fact of the, of the great active humanitarian work that you do oh, yeah. um, and the tremendous amounts of performances for charity that you do as well. So I look at your life that that that, that people have given you um, and those close to you have, have given you a wonderful foundation to become the person you are 
and and you are no doubt repaying that back in droves and spades to to right. so many others and you are just putting the smiles that's why i love music so much is is it just it, it increases a mood it puts smiles on people's faces you yeah. could be feeling down and listen to a piece of music or listen to a performance and all of a sudden it transforms you mm-hmm. out of yeah. uh, a, a, a feeling of, you know, of wherever you are into a feeling of absolute pure bliss. So um, this has been an incredible conversation. Um, yeah, you're an I'm incredible lucky. voice of value, Kim, so thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I would just want to say that all that humanitarian work that I do was inspired by my parents because my parents have been, you know, helping... Um, refugees have come to Australia, settle into into the country, and 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 not it's not just church stuff. They're just really great people that want to help 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 people in every way they can, and that and they've encouraged me to do the same. And I realised, you know, now that I've have an established career, that I I don't need to be paid for every single concert that I can do, and I can afford to do a handful of concerts every year somewhere in the world, charge the normal ticket price, fill up a theatre, and send that all that money to people that need it. And, and and it's it's no skin off my nose to do something like that, and I feel good about it. And I'm and as I get older, that becomes more of a prominent part of my my projects is to do more humanitarian work. You know, it becomes it's becoming more and more about others and less about myself. Well, what we know is Kim that giving starts the receiving process. You give the world your talent, you give of yourself, you give in so many ways, and I think it's fair to say that, as Pete says, music just it just transcends the soul, it takes you from where you are to where you know you rightly should be. And I suspect that whilst Qantas might have brought you to Australia, I think where you are in your parents' guest room at the moment is right where you should be right now in this world. And no doubt when you're next in front of an audience, that's exactly where you should be. And anywhere you are is where you should be because this gift is not a, an accident. Uh, your, your, your sort of uh, father's uh, name being a name that you were given at the orphanage doesn't happen by accident. That, that's, a, that's a unique link as well. What I think Pete's saying nicely, it's a nice way of saying we, we do have to get you back for part two. We do have to get you mm-hmm. back for uh, another interview because uh, as anyone who's ever been on our show knows, if we think there's a value hack there that we haven't really explored, we'll get it back. And I'm sure the feedback's going to confirm that. In a way of summing up, mate, I think it's fair to say that the greatest gift any child can give their parent is to take all the blessings and all the opportunities and all the gifts that they were given and go out and shine as bright and go as long and go as far as their talent will take them. And that's the gift that comes beautifully back to your parents. And I'm sure... Yeah. If David and Judith were part of this right now, they would be beaming with pride, not just for you and not obviously, you know, for Michael and Rebecca and Catherine, but for all the kids that they've influenced and touched with your dad's ministry work, with your your mum's support work and all those sorts of things. And you are a byproduct. Sometimes some of the some of the best gifts come poorly wrapped. And to start the days of your life, the first few days anyway, abandoned, clearly you're loved, you have returned that love in spades and you've taken your gift as far as you've been allowed to. And in some respects, your wings have spread, you've you've flapped them hard and you're gliding to where you should be. And I know for myself personally, this has been one of my absolute favourite interviews and we say that a lot more often than not because it just seems present in mind to say that. I'm saying based on the three gifts that you shared with us today, the gift of certainty and opportunity amongst an uncertain world and I think more importantly, second of all, the stories that just say if you just back your talent and if you just back yourself in and see the possibility and opportunity in every difficulty and every challenge that your talent will shine. And I think the third thing is, is that to give back for those who have helped you and then to others you yet to meet, just to give back out of humanitarian sort of needs mm-hmm. is one of those great contributions sort of gifts that uh, only the very special voices of value have. So for me, Pete, it's been one of my favourites. I'll leave you to say thank you to our guest and we'll wrap up. Yeah, thank you, Kim. That's uh it's been an absolute pleasure and I'm sure the listeners and viewers out there will get so much out of this and really important to like and share and share this with as many people. I think this is, this is a great, um, great voice of hope um, and it's, it's a wonderful message, um, particularly in the times we're in currently. And, Kim, your time has been incredibly invaluable to us and we, uh, we thank you very much. No, I love your shows. I love your I love your podcast so much. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. And and I would like to do the second interview because I'd like to talk to you sometime about the the, the influence of world travel, and and how that influences my life and my outlook on humanity. 
you know, because I've traveled 144 countries and I'm not just talking about stopping at the airports. You know, I, I go into villages where most people dare not to go. You know, and every time I do that, that it, it, it makes me grow in ways you can, most people can't even imagine. You know, and there's a lot I have to say about traveling and, and, and our place in the world. But well, I've the, yeah, had a great time talking to you guys. Absolutely, it's been an absolute pleasure. Well, there's the teaser to keep everybody retuning back in. But as Pete said, like it, share it, share it with your networks and make sure you get the opportunity, if you can, to reach out to Kim. We'll put all of his contact details on the links here to access him. And if you are in a town where you're able to go out and see quality talent like Kim Perling, you can do yourself an absolute pleasure and favour. And most importantly, you can fill up your, your cup and, and enjoy what is a world-class talent all the way from Adelaide to the world, from Ho Chi Minh City initially, uh, it's fair to say that this is a world-class voice of value. We've been thrilled to bring him to you. We hope that we can add another additional interview in the weeks and months ahead. Please make sure you like, share and let us know. And for now, until next week, this is Rick Rushton, my good friend Peter Kakos, our very special guest, Kim Pilling, saying thank you for listening and watching. Thanks, Rick. Thank Thanks, Peter. Pleasure. See you later, guys. Bye. We trust you enjoyed this episode of Voices of Value, a shared conversation between Rick Rushton and Peter Kakos and their valued guests. Their views are not necessarily those of the wider world, but they should be. You can subscribe through your favorite podcast provider to ensure you never miss an episode. And as always, we welcome your feedback, ratings and reviews of the content we provide. Additional information can be sourced from our website, VoicesOfValuePodcast.com. We look forward to you joining the conversation again next week when Rick and Peter continue the search for truth, justice, and the value-added way. Hold up. 